Okay, Michelle, Arizona State football, uh, typically a contender in the Pac-12, but a lot of news coming out of um, Tempe during the offseason, mostly not for the best of reasons, but a lot of uncertainty surrounding the program with the NCAA investigations. Well, I guess the first thing, everybody wants to know why Herm still has a job. And I address it this way. If you get rid of Herm, who do you bring in? Who from the outside would want to jump on this train wreck that this program is right now? So what are the chances you're going to get a good, viable candidate from the outside? I don't think there is one. So now the second option is what about guys on staff that you might give the interim label to? Well, they've got a lot of new coaches. They don't have that guy that's been Herm's right-hand man for a number of years. So you really don't, I mean, that longest tenured coach on the staff is the special teams coach, Sean Slocum, who predates Herm. You want him to be the head coach? I just don't know that there's another option that's better. And from the players that I've talked to, the players still support Herm. So I think for the sake of some consistency in the program and the fact that Herm still has the backing of his players, I think you just have to ride it out for now and see where this thing goes. So Michelle, you know, I, I'm a Phoenix native and I'm, I'm, I'm back in Phoenix now. I spent some time in Seattle, but like I've you know lived in the Pac-12 footprint all my life. And, uh, you know, but being in Phoenix as I have been, the real head scratcher for me is why hasn't Michael Crow fired Ray Anderson? Because we all know that Ray Anderson and his hire of Herm Edwards, like the two were joined at the hip, like their success was going to be together. And so with the program, you know, obviously waiting for the NCAA to potentially drop the hammer, why not clean house? I'm like, why do you wait for the NCAA to do its thing with Ray Anderson still in charge? So I like, you know, I, I, I think what you said is very much on point. It makes sense that, you know, you, you, you know you're not going to get a quality uh, replacement. But the Ray Anderson piece of this, like, don't you have to clean house there? and say like this this program athletic program is being mismanaged and we at least have to get someone else in charge of running the whole program and i would have to think that arizona state struggles in terms of getting an nil donor collective getting boosters on board that ray anderson is really the obstacle there more than her absolutely and i think asu being behind the curve when it comes to this nil thing it's hard to tell donors and boosters, hey, come give money to us when they're not behind the guy running the program. So it's kind of like one problem and another problem that's comp compounded. But I just think that they're going to ride this thing out. I agree. Most people wanted the plug pulled on Ray a long time ago. Ray won't pull the plug on her. He just isn't going to do that. Of course. He's his guy. Yeah. No, no absolutely. But I just think that they're going to see where this thing goes. And with Ray Anderson, there are things more than just the football program. There are you know, don't even get me started about some of the things that we, we could go into as far as why Ray maybe shouldn't be there anymore. Um, but, you know, and today, today the academic success rate came out and ASU's number one in the Pac-12 ahead of Stanford. So, you know, they're waving that thing right now. They're waving that flag right now as much as they can wave it. But I think they're just they just want to ride this thing out and see where this thing goes. Um, with this investigation. And I think that's kind of when heads will roll at that point. Do you have any idea of when the NCA might uh, announce penalties and when, and what the timetable might be for that? And, and perhaps if people are uncertain of that, just what, what's a way to read the tea leaves and get a sense of when the NCA might be, might be showing its hand? Well, there's some word that we might hear the notice of allegations by late fall, like maybe after the season, but who knows, did we ever get a resolution to the University of Arizona basketball situation, which is about, if my memory serves me correct, are we on about four or five years of that? So who knows how long these things are going to take? I mean, I think a lot of ASU people want to know right now because they just want to get it over with. Throw it at us, let us take our lumps and go from there. But as long as it's hanging in the wind, it's harder to recruit. It's hard to do this. It's harder to do that. So I think a lot of ASU faithful would rather just get their penalty now and be done with it. 
One other question, just kind of looking back on the past several months at ASU Athletics, you know, it, it came as a surprise to me when Jaden Daniels initially said that he was staying with the program, but then, of course, he then transferred out. What was the backstory on that as to why Jaden Daniels first said he was going to stay? Like he knew that the NCAA was was waiting uh, with its hammer and sickle and that, that, you know, bad things were about to come down. And yet he made that initial commitment. I think that, that was the surprise, not that he transferred out. What, what was the backstory on that? Well, absolutely. I 100% agree. Most of us were waiting for Jaden to jump ship long before that. He wasn't on the page, same page with Zach Hill. That was no secret. They never seemed to jive as far as the offense goes. And, um, you know, he decided he was coming back. So most of us were shaking our heads. And then when Zach left, now you would think one of his biggest obstacles is now gone. That would lead him to stay. But I think it came down to what is the talent around him. I don't think that he felt comfortable with the playmakers around him. I think he stayed, initially said he was going to stay hoping they'd get a wide receiver. They'd get an offensive lineman. I think he was kind of waiting to see what tools were going to be brought in. And then at the time it came for almost the start of spring practice, he's going, oh, I don't know. I'm not real comfortable what's around me. So at that point, I think he just made the decision that he just wasn't sure. So now he had to leave. And, and you know, he left uh, kind of at the end of the whole cycle where people were in the portal. So he didn't have a ton of options. Um, so it would, would have made sense for him to go sooner. But I think he was trying to give ASU the benefit of the doubt and seeing that what tools they were going to bring in around him. The Gentry and Pearsall departures probably were the straw that broke the camel's back in this regard. Would that be fair to say? I believe he was in the portal before those happened. Oh, okay. 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 So uh, Gentry was entirely an NIL driven thing. Um, it, his family is not very well off. I'm her. I heard he got six figures, maybe 650 close to 700 thousand worth of NIL. I don't have anything firm on that. So you can't blame the kid in that respect. Um, I wouldn't blame the kid either. He can set up his family for life. I don't blame the kid. Um, Gentry took part in spring practice and there has never been an indication that he wasn't happy here. He was going to be a starter next year as a sophomore, probably moving into the spot that Darian Butler was in last year. So there would have been no reason for him to leave if it wasn't something like NIL. With Pearsall, I think it might be a little bit of a different situation. I think that might be more a product of not sure about the offense and not sure who is going to be the quarterback. So I don't think Pearsall's move was necessarily NIL driven. I think that might have been more of a personnel driven decision. And with every kid, it's different. Michelle, there are some components to the NCAA investigation that are somewhat unprecedented because these infractions occurring during the pandemic. Um, and, and in terms of that factoring into the perceived severity of it, well, the PAC 12 took the pandemic more seriously than every other conference in college football. Uh, that obviously is though being uh, investigated by the NCAA. Uh, is there a, a feel for, how severe this case is being judged and what the expectations of what the penalties could be or should be. I kind of haven't gotten a gauge on that. Now I know that ASU is going to say all of the, all, they've cleaned house pretty much with most, most of the coaching staff that was involved in all of that. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. You know, I, who knows if they're going to qualify for a bowl this year or not. It's not really looking like it right now, but Maybe they self-impose that bull ban if they do qualify. So I think they're going to do what they can to mitigate things, but it's kind of hard to tell right now. Herm Edwards obviously is a guy that uh, is very unique in college football because of his charisma, his ability to connect with both the media and with young people, people various ages. This has been a strong suit of his, as has been his ability to win people over. What has he said during the midst of all this, how much responsibility has he taken? How has he framed what has happened and how much um, blame has he taken on and what steps does he believe the program should take or is he committed to 
to to to ensure that these sorts of things don't happen in the future. Well, you know, he basically says what you'd expect him to say. Um, there was one press conference during the spring where he was, you know, pretty much, I think it was a TV reporter that kind of went after him pretty good in, in, a, in availability. And he kind of skirted the subject, basically. He just said, I'm the coach. I'm going to lead this team. And, I, 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 you know, I don't think he didn't necessarily – take any responsibility per se, but I wouldn't expect him to do that. He'd just say, Hey, we're going to work with the people that are in the building. If players want to leave, let them leave. If coaches are going to leave, they're going to leave. They're going to move on. And we're going to operate with the people that are in this building. And he pretty much said what you would expect him to say. Um, and I, the one thing about her, like you said, he's, I, I needed him a few weeks ago and I texted him and said, Herm, I need you for five minutes. Can you call me back? He called me back right away. A month before that, he was on vacation in Carmel. And he called me back from vacation when I need like so. He's great from my from my standpoint. There's nobody better. Herm is great, but yeah, I, I just think that he's trying to give an even keel message to the players. He's just he's trying to, you know, he doesn't want them too much thinking about all the off field off the field stuff. He's just trying to toe the line, and he he basically is saying what you would expect him to say, which is. Not because he can't really talk about it. He's not going to, he's not going to talk about it. Michelle Gardner joining us as she has a number of times here at the voice of college football. You can uh, join Michelle's work there at uh, Arizona Republic covering Arizona state athletics. Uh, you both alluded to this earlier, the obvious challenges in recruiting when you've got this type of situation hanging over your head, looking at the commitment list, it's only June We've got six months, but still you can start to with all the camps and all the recruiting official and unofficial visits going on across the country. This is a time where we see them start to, to flood in and we see Arizona state for 2023 with one hard commit. Most teams are in the eight to 10 range. Should we be reading into that? Or is that exactly what you're talking about? Well, they've had a number of kids on campus. They've had a ton of visits. I think a lot of people are going to wait and see maybe if this thing plays out before the end of the season. And, hey, there's always the transfer portal if all else fails. There are plenty of players in the transfer portal. So, you know, I, I think you'd be – if you're an ASU fan, you would have been worried about it before this transfer portal thing because the high school ranks were the only place you could build, build your team. But, you know, I think they've done a pretty good job through the portal this year. They are going to be thin at several different positions, but they've actually brought in guys that were starters in other programs at some key positions. So I wouldn't read too much into it yet. All right, Michelle, let's look forward uh, to not just the 2022 season, but really to like the next two, three years of football. And I know that, you know, the PAC 12 is almost certain to get rid of divisions, but we still have the framework of the PAC 12 South and you do have regional competitors I think one of the big questions that's likely to emerge in Pac-12 South football in the next two years or so could be after this season is Kyle Whittingham potentially retiring after the 2022 season because he has this loaded Utah team picked to go to the college football playoff by some outlets. It would be the natural jumping off point for Whittingham, you know, who has a family, wants to spend more time with his grandkids. So if, if Kyle Whittingham retires – after the 2022 season, you know, how do you, and, and, you know, we could have ASU making a coaching change before 2023. Have you thought about some of the coaching carousel plot twists and maybe the things that Michael Crow needs to think about in terms of how he repositions the ASU program and what this program is, is uh, capable of? Because obviously, as you know, well, Ted Fish is recruiting up a storm in Tucson. He's showing signs of building back that program. Uh, I think most people would say that Arizona is in a better position right now than Arizona State, which is really hard to, to you know, uh, put into context when you think about the 70 to 7 debacle and the Kevin Sumlin exit. So with the Whittingham plot point, with Arizona gaining momentum under fish on the recruiting trail, just what, what do you think needs to be the big picture vision for Arizona State as it uh, imagines you know, what this program can be in the 2020s? I think it's really hard to have any clue where things are going to go until this, the dust settles with this thing. I mean, I got no idea, really. It, it's just there are too many variables here. I think Arizona State is still a pretty good spot for a good coach. 
whether, you know, no matter who it is. And, and my guess is that maybe Herm's not here after this season, assuming we get some sort of semi-resolution, like may, at least a notice of allegations at this point. I think Arizona State, is it ever going to be a Utah or Oregon? No. But I also don't think it's going to be bottom of the barrel either. I, I think there's potential here. Um, and I think people, I think athletes would want to play here. There's a lot of good reasons for them to want to play here. So I just think, I think this thing has to be resolved before we can see how ASU plays out. All right. Uh, Arizona state coming off an eight and five season, but uh, a lot of uncertainty entering 2022. They go to the LA Coliseum on October 1st to face USC. Michelle, we appreciate you stopping by. Matt, did you have anything else for Michelle? I didn't, but just uh, great to talk to you. And thanks for joining the program here in, here in Phoenix. Well, I, I'm going to say this. A lot of the reporters have kind of talked about what we think this team can do. And before they lost Gentry and Lole, we were thinking maybe a 500. I think the defense has up front enough talent that maybe the defense can ha- make them hang in there. I think the success of this team all depends on quarterback. And I'm assuming it's going to be Emory Jones. I don't think they would have gotten went out during the summer and gotten another quarterback if they thought one of the five in their camp could do the job. So I'm assuming it's going to be Emory Jones, but I think the success of this team is all going to depend on how Emory Jones does. And I would think that most college football observers would take Jaden Daniels over Emory Jones, but it's not by a huge margin. It's not a huge drop in play from uh, those two quarterbacks and Jaden Daniels not coming off the best season with 10 TDs and 10 picks last year as well. Uh, Michelle, we appreciate you stopping by. And again, everybody check out Michelle's work at uh, Arizona Republic. Thanks, Michelle. Anytime. All right. Once again, uh, Michelle at uh, the Arizona Republic covering uh, the Sun Devils and boy, a lot to unpack there as we head toward 2022 and a lot of uncertainty. We'll know more when the two teams get together in October. Yeah. And I would just point out before we transition to other topics that, you know, w- before this NCAA storm hit ASU, you know, the USC ASU game was, you know, an anticipated event, but this year, like this is like one of the automatic W's for the Trojans. Like I'm, I'm writing it in. I like that there's there's zero <laughs> doubt that USC is going to p- post a 40 burger on Arizona State. It's going to be like a, you know, 45, 21 type game. Like I'm just chalking that one up. And that that's a that's a testament to how far Arizona State has fallen. 